Good um, I'm Raging Stokes. I'm Assistant Cultural Affairs Officer of the U.S. Embassy here in Kiev. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you today Amit Bishop, who is here as part of the Kiev Pride festivities this week and part of U.S. Embassy's support to Kiev Pride. Amit is a global health expert. And today she's going to be telling us all about LGBTI movements around the world, what that means for all of us, really, and um, how we can all become more active participants in the movement, what's been happening before, what will happen in the future. So I welcome your active participation. There will be a Q&A session after the lecture. And um, we'll also be videotaping the lecture, just so all of you know, if you're not comfortable being on video, I recommend you move to the back so we won't see your head. That's not a problem. Um, but anyway, thank you all for going. Thank you, Regine. Thank you so much. Can, can you hear okay, hopefully? Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I want to thank Regine Stokes and the U.S. Embassy for supporting my visit here. I want to thank uh, America House, of course, and Christine, I just met, right? <laughs> Christine there? <Yeah. laughs> and, um, and also my um, colleagues here in Ukraine who've been working tirelessly on the issues of LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender um, rights. Um, I also want to thank my son, Nicholas, wave your hand, <laughs> who is here with me in uh, Ukraine. Um, I'm, I'm really fortunate today, today to be able to speak to um, topics that are both professional for me and also very personal. Um, I worked, have worked in Ukraine off and on for almost 20 years with an organization called PATH, which does international health work around the world, and we've uh, been in Ukraine since 1994, and I have two beloved PATH colleagues here with me. Um, and uh, uh, I've, I've since left PATH about a year and a half ago, but I'm still consulting and still work uh, as much as I possibly can with my, my colleagues. Um, and I'm also, I've been involved for about nine years with an organization called Outright Action International, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, but, you know, we all have many identities, right? I'm, I'm, I, uh, ah, no. Um, <laughs> um, I'm a woman of a certain age, as my mother likes to say about any, anybody over 50. Um, <laughs> I'm a mom, I'm a spouse. Uh, I am a lesbian, I'm an activist, um, I'm all of these things. And so first on the, on the personal, make sure this is, I've got this going here. This is my family. Um, <laughs> this is actually, this is actually uh, my spouse, Renee, um, with whom I've, I've shared my life for more than 27 years. Uh, we have two kids, Nicholas, who's here, is 15, and a, an older boy who's 18, about to graduate from high school. Uh, this was taken two years ago on the occasion of our wedding um, on our 25th anniversary of being together. <laughs> and uh, we went down to the judge in Seattle and, and uh, did, did the deed, and, um, and we're lucky to be able to do so. Uh, you know, we're pr a pretty ordinary family when it comes down to it. Uh, we're built on a foundation of, of um, a deep love and, and desire to make sure our kids um, have great futures and clean their rooms and do their homework. <laughs> and we're probably not so successful in those things, but. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me move on to really the, the topic at hand here. What I'm hoping to do today is talk a bit about some of the, the recent milestones um, in securing human rights for LGBT uh, people around the world. Is everyone familiar and okay, comfortable with the acronyms? Hi, Anna. Um, <laughs> so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and I is for intersex. In the US, we also add a Q sometimes, which is queer or questioning. Um, Sorry? And a plus. And a plus, yes, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, the letters will keep coming probably. Um, <laughs> so um, I also want to talk about sort of the manifestations and the impact of discrimination on our lives. Um, and um, finally, the implications and sort of my own observations about um, what's happening in this region and how it connects to what's happening globally. 
so just a, just a couple of words about um, Outright Action International. Um, we are uh, based in New York City. We are one of the longest standing organizations in the world dedicated to uh, defending and protecting the human rights of LGBT people around the world. Um, we do this in a variety of ways. Um, we work at a uh, national level in partnership with activists to uh, advocate for adherence and respect for human rights through training and documentation, documentation on abuses, how to use that documentation for the purposes of advocacy. We also work a lot with media. We work a lot with regional and um, national human rights bodies. And we do a lot of work at the United Nations level. Uh, we have, uh, we're one of just a handful of organizations that have observer status at the UN, which means we can be at the table. Uh, and we are um, therefore able to uh, bring issues to uh, UN United Nations uh, bodies and urge accountability for, um, uh, well, country accountability for their actions. So when we talk about accountability, um, you know, you may know this, but it, it turns out that most countries in the world have signed on to a range of treaties and covenants that actually compel them uh, to uphold and protect the rights of all of their citizens. So these are just a few, and I don't mean to go into detail about each one, but the point is that um, countries that criminalize homosexuality through sodomy laws that are um, otherwise uh, in some way violating human rights, are passing anti-propaganda laws, things like that, they're in fact in direct uh, contravention and, and contradiction to many of what are considered the global norms of, tr of treatment for, for all human beings. So for example, did you realize that almost three billion people live in countries where being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender is actually criminal? It's a criminal offense. Um, we, again, you know, the United Nations, we may have different opinions about how effective it is and when it's most effective, but when, if you're living in a country where you are suffering abuse and, that, and your country maybe doesn't have strong rule of law, um, where corruption prevails, uh, where um, life is very difficult, then you need to have other ways of recourse. And so this is actually where it's important, again, to have outside uh, accountability. And so that's, again, in, in the case of the United Nations and other bodies, why that's important to have. So just a little bit more um, on the criminalization. So 75 countries cur currently criminalize same gender sexual activity. These are known as sodomy laws in many countries. They're relics mostly of the uh, United Kingdom and colonization during that period. Of course, Britain has long ago abandoned those laws, but many of its former colonies have not. So what's a bit ironic about this is that there's a lot of prevailing discourse that homosexuality has somehow been exported from the West. But in fact, in many countries, it's homophobia that's been exported from the West through these, uh, through these laws um, and also through uh, missionary activity and religious activity on, on the more conservative evangelical side, um, both historically and certainly currently as well. And so what happens is that um, we, and I'll talk more about this, often get caught in, in the middle um, of these so-called culture wars and, and are often used as scapegoats. So again, just looking at a, a map of the, the dark blue here where legal and protective laws are in place, um, where there are actual explicit laws that legalize being LGBT, the darker pink is where it's illegal, um, and the lighter pink is where it's illegal and punishable by death.
I think everyone knows uh, Desmond Tutu. I'll just get some water here. One of my heroes. He is one of the very few prominent religious leaders in the world, but definitely on the African continent, who has been extremely outspoken in support of uh, adhering and defending uh, human rights for LGBT people. And you know, I think it's really important that he draws this comparison to apartheid. So no one should be excluded from our love, our compassion, or our concern because of race, gender, faith, or ethnicity, or because of their sexual orientation nor should anyone be excluded from health care on any of these grounds. In my country of South Africa, we struggled for years against the evil system of apartheid that divided human beings, children of the same God, by racial classification, and then denied many of them fundamental human rights. We knew this was wrong, and it's time to stand up against another wrong. So this is, this is profound, <laughs> and it also, um, represents in some way his outspokenness, a particular moment in history that we're in right now. There really hasn't, it's unprecedented. There's not been a time, not in my lifetime, <laughs> that um, issues related to the human rights of LGBT people um, have been so visible, so part of global, national, regional discourse, um, never before has so much project progress been made in many places, not everywhere, but in many places so quickly. Um, and um, never before have we had so much vocal support from national governments, from the United Nations, from actually uh, business leaders in, in the case of my own country, and I'll talk a little bit more of that, about that in a second. Um, and with progress, as we know, often in any social movement comes backlash. And I think what we're seeing now as well is a pretty profound backlash. Uh, it's a signal of the globalization of our efforts. I think it's a signal of the ability to communicate so easily now um, across boundaries. Uh, and therefore, there is a much stronger link between global, national, regional, movements um, to secure protection of, of LGBT people. So on the point of um, global leadership, Ban Ki-moon um, has in the last few years emerged as a, I would say unexpectedly emerged <laughs> as a very positive, outspoken supporter. And um, this has been amazingly important. Uh, I think that uh, his ability to be so direct, uh, and I'll just highlight his last sentence there, my promise to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender members of the human family is this, I am with you. Uh, he has not just used words, he's funding, uh, the UN is funding a lot of work through civil society in a number of different countries. They've got something called the Free and Equal Campaign that's going on, which if you go online and look that up, you'll see videos, you'll see various campaigns. They're funding work uh, in Asia called, uh, through what's called the Being LGBT in Asia Initiative. Um, so it's, it's really quite amazing what's happening. On a more sort of political level, uh, two things, uh, two resolutions uh, through the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council were passed, one in 2011, one in 2014. These resolutions uh, were, um, the, the point of them was to condemn the violence, uh, condemn violence globally on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, so this is a photograph of the voting tally of the second one. And so you can see that um, the, you know, which countries, the, the green countries are the ones that, that um, voted yes. Um, Russia was a no, Kazakhstan was an ab abstain. And then in the kind of Eastern European space, in the yes column were Czech Republic, Estonia, Montenegro, Romania, uh, Macedonia. So these are just the members of the, uh, in this moment of the, of the Human Rights Council, it's not the entire, all of the member states. But what's interesting about this too is that in, the, in 2011, the, the margin of success, 
They, they passed the resolu resolution by three votes. In 2014, by 11 votes. So we're seeing progress. The, the last thing I'll say that's important about this is that when you pass a resolution like this, it then triggers action. So what comes out of this is a report, an investigation, a report globally about the status of LGBT, LGBT lives around the world. And that's exactly what happened. And so um, <clears throat> just quickly, I'm sorry this is a little bit dense with uh, text, but so this report came after the, the resolution in 2014. And what it found was, not surprisingly, hate-motivated violence against LGBT people based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression is wise, widespread, brutal, and often perpetrated with impunity. In many countries, laws used to punish LGBT people restrict rights of freedom of expression, assembly, and association. Everyday discrimination due to entrenched attitudes and lack of protections affects LGBTI people everywhere, including in education, housing, healthcare, employment, and within fa families. <clears throat> and then finally, what they're saying is that states are, are now legally bound by international human rights law to respect, protect, and fulfill the human rights of all persons within their jurisdiction. Not some persons, all persons. So just switching quickly to my own country, um, because the US does have such influence, I also want to point out that under President Obama's administration, we've also seen unprecedented support on these issues. And we've seen, I mean, that's partly why I'm here, actually funded by the, by the US Embassy. And this is something he, he said in his inauguration speech. And it was the first time ever that a standing president even touched on the issue. So it was really, again, remarkable and, and inspiring. So I wanted to show you this map. Um, it's on marriage equality. And it's not because I believe that the issue of marriage equality should be the goal for every country in the world at this time. I, I, I don't. Um, in most countries, this is actually far from uh, a priority, where, especially where basic rights are, are being violated on, it, on a daily basis. Um, it was important for our country because of where we were in our movement, but also because it was very much a matter of equality. Without marriage, we were being denied several hundred rights, including related to taxes, including pension benefits, health care, uh, uh, visitation rights. So if my partner were to get sick, I wouldn't necessarily have a right to go visit her. So a whole host of, of, um, of benefits and rights that we were not getting access to. So that's why it was important. I also. Um, believe that it's important to raise this issue because marriage equality, oh, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> my, my makeshift podium. Um, marriage equality is being used as sort of a, I don't know, Trojan horse, if you will, to curtail rights. So the presumption by governments who are, who are wanting to curtail rights that uh, they're using marriage equality as the, as the way in. So take ex uh, the example of Nigeria, which passed um, a same-sex marriage prohibition act. The Nigerian movement is, was not prioritizing marriage equality, but it was a way for the government to kind of raise the specter of fear that this was somehow imminent. Um, and through that law, what they actually did was um, pass legislation very similar to anti -propaganda, the anti-propaganda laws in Russia, which is curtailing freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, and a whole host of things. So, but but mar the marriage issue was what was the entry point for that. I think also Putin has been <laughs> using that, as I understand here in Ukraine. There were a number of signs around Kiev at one point that were saying that the association with the European Union would be equal to gay marriage. So just as I said, with progress comes backlash. 
Um, and so it's actually a good sign, it's, but it's, it's, it's a dangerous time as well. Um, we're seeing this globally across many countries, the rise of xenophobia, resurgence of racism, uh, curtailing of civil society. We see it in the form of leaders that are emerging. In my own country, I would put Donald Trump in that category, not to get too political. I'd Marine Le Pen, uh, Norbert Hofer in, in Austria, who almost won. I mean, this is it's sort of a global phenomenon. It's not just in any single uh, country. On the LGBT issues, the forms of oppression are similar. The, 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 the narrative that's being put forth, not just about the marriage stuff, but notions of protecting children and the, and the real fear mongering that goes, goes with that. Um, a lot of brutality and a, and a, and a real uptick in, in violence. Um, and then of course, as I've already referred to, attempts at legislating discrimination. Um, in, in the US, you know, it's a continuing uh, issue of, of, of I, how to put it, sort of defining the other. And for, for us in America, it's really important that we don't work in isolation for human rights of LGBT people. We need to link our movement with the movement for, <laughs> oh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> That's just so me. Um, boop, boop, boop. Okay, we need to link our movement to uh, the, the anti-racism movement, racial equality, economic justice, climate justice, immigration reform and immigration rights. All of these things, at least where I come from, need to be brought together. So speaking of backlash in my own country, um, I don't know how much news gets to Ukraine and Kiev. Um, but we are definitely seeing backlash in the U.S. Um, some of you may have heard of what's happened in North Carolina, the state of North Carolina, the passage of what was called a House Bill 2, HB 2. Um, it overrides all local ordinances in the entire state that had any protections on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, um, regarding jobs, employment, um, public accommodations. Um, it bars even in future, the municip municipal legis legislation to protect people. And it also, which has been the, one, the issue that's gotten the most coverage, um, prohibits transgender people from using the bathrooms of their gender identity. In other words, they're saying, you need to go to the bathroom that corresponds to the gender you were born with, the sex characteristics and gender that you were born with, um, which is a complete misunderstanding of who tra transgender people are. And it's, it's kind of an absurd argument, and yet this, these bathroom bills are being proposed uh, in a number of states. North Carolina is the uh, one to first succeed in passing it. What's interesting about this is that um, there have been now boycotts, major corporations who had plans to um, open branches in North Carolina are pulling out. Uh, famous rock stars who had concerts scheduled in North Carolina are now boycotting and saying we're not going. It's not clear yet what's going to happen there, but uh, it certainly has created an enormous amount of discussion and visibility in, in the U.S. The other kind of legislation that we're seeing in the U.S., uh, examples in Indiana, Mississippi, um, are these so-called religious freedom restoration acts. So in Indiana, um, social conservatives Wanted, to, wanted a law that would insulate them from the progress being made towards upholding human rights for LGBT people. So the laws basically allowed that businesses could be exempt from upholding the bans on discrimination. So I can't serve you because it's against my religion, it offends my religion. Um, it's, you know, it's completely contradictory to the very foundations of the United States, separation of church and state. It also uh, is in fact discriminatory. Um, what was ironic in the Indiana case is that they did reverse themselves 
And where previously there had been no mention of sexual orientation and gender identity in, in protective laws, now they have it, <laughs> all because of the, this, um, this debate and, uh, uh, and um, threats of boycott. In my own state of, of Washington State, uh, we are being threatened with a bill that would also um, be one of these bathroom bills as well as would uh, roll back protections that have been in place for more than 10 years for LGBT people. Personally, I don't think it's going to get anywhere, but we're mobilizing now to, to be ready. So that's, that's the U.S. Um, just, and I'll just go a few examples around the world that we're also seeing this backlash. Probably you've heard about Uganda. Um, in um, 2014, um, actually before that, a law that, or a, a piece of legislation that people dubbed the Kill the Gays Bill was proposed. And in it, it was essentially invoking the death penalty for chronic homosexuality. It got tabled. It didn't pass, but another form of that bill that took out the death penalty did pass in 2014. It has since been annulled on a technicality, but we're pretty sure it's going to come back in some form. In uh, the Middle East, um, in Egypt, for example, uh, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, we also have seen heightened repression raids and, and arrests. And in, in Egypt, for example, they don't have sodomy laws, but they have um, laws against acts of debauchery, sort of vaguely defined. And that's what's being used to crack down. So a raid on a, on a men's bathhouse, as it turns out, these 26 men were found innocent. They were acquitted completely, but their lives were deeply affected. One of them tried to commit suicide. They've been, I mean, it's, it's been a horrible impact on their lives. So, I mean, there are many, I could, I don't want to, believe me, there are many, many examples of, um, far too many examples of, of these, this kind of backlash happening around the world um, from ISIS in Iraq, uh, pushing gay men off of buildings to what's happening in West Africa um, to uh, what's happening in, 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 in a number of countries around the world where legislation is being proposed to further criminalize. So moving to this region, um, I mean, I think you're a, you're, you, I may not be telling you anything new here at all, but you know, we saw from the break, after the breakup of the Soviet Union a, an incredible expansion of democratic reform, civil society emergence, prolifer proliferation of civil society organizations. And this began to change not just here but around the world after 9-11, I think, with um, greater scrutiny of especially the civil society se sector, concerns about terrorism and movement of money and things like this. Um, and at the same time, a growing anxiety on the part of more sort of authoritarian style leaders uh, and the con continued expansion of pro-democracy pro movements like the so-called color revolutions here and, and in the region, um, also in parts of, of Af Africa. And so what we've seen is this closing space of civil society, which is probably, you all are here, you <laughs> probably are well aware of this. Um, so just as an example, between 2004 and 2010, more than 50 countries enacted new measures restricting NGO registration, uh, activities, demonstrations, events, so freedom of assembly. After the Arab Spring period, another 90 new laws around the world were enacted targeting in particular organizations and uh, human rights defenders, individual people, through detentions, public denunciations, violence, disappearances. And, um, and so this map here, uh, shows where these so-called um, anti-propaganda laws have been either proposed or pending or in place or have been overturned. And I think it's self-evident um, as uh, far as I understand, I mean, it's failed in Ukraine. And I, you tell me if there's any, do you think there's any chance that it will be reintroduced in some form? Or is, there, is that always kind of a threat? What do you think? 
Hard to know. We'll talk after. It's all right. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm not going to go th through all of all of this, but I but they're really the, the, not only are the is the anti propaganda uh, propaganda laws um, incredibly insidious and destructive in this region and in, in Russia in particular. Um, but they're being, it's being, the Russia law is being used as a model for countries not even in this region. So I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But what's also kind of symbolic of this, or, or what, these, what this is about, is really trying to promote a discourse of a revival of traditional values, right? Um, and we're getting scapegoated as uh, a sort of somehow a foreign phenomenon corruption of the West that's encroaching on sovereignty in the East. Uh, and, um, and what's happening is a rise of violence, a rise of, uh, or, or a reduction in the ability for people to work and move effectively. Um, and it's, it's really quite frightening what's happening. I think the, the, the upside, if there is such a thing, is that they have, and, I, and I'd love to hear the opinion of you all, but it, I think it's also work to mobilize people and mobilize alliances um, so that these laws don't proliferate further. Uh, and um, so I think that's actually a good thing, as, as that often happens when things, really scary things happen, you mobilize to, to fight back. Uh, I really love um, this woman, Stella Nianzi. She's an anthropologist from Uganda who came and spoke at the University of Washington a couple of years ago. And I think this kind of sums it up. Because in, in some way, actually, the cracking down of civil society and the pitting East against West and using the issue of homosexuality as, as sort of the red herring, it's really about this. It's about power, about how the powerful can even use sexuality as a proxy for angry nationalism as fuel for social division, as a means to deflect attention from what's really going on. I mean, Uganda is an example. They, the, 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 the heightened corruption, uh, uh, um, weakening economic environment, it was really a way to consolidate power, was to sort of distract citizenry from what, what the real issues were. So let me switch. I mentioned um, that my, my professional background is actually in global health and in public health. And I've been working in the field for more than 30 years. Um, and because uh, I have these two parts of my life, um, I have to, have to address this. Uh, it's not to suggest that discrimination doesn't equally damage uh, or it doesn't have equally damaging implications for other basic needs like housing and employment, um, access to social services, but health is what I know, so that's what we're going to talk about. So um, it's in a number of countries around the world, including my own, uh, it's well documented that where people uh, or where stigma and discrimination against LGBT people exists, their health suffers. And this makes sense, because if you feel you can't be open about who you are, if you, if you are afraid of the kind of reaction you're going to get when you go see your medical provider, you're not going to go. Um, and so you, you might be afraid, for example, that your confidentiality will not be respected. That happens a lot. You might face hostility. You might, um, at, at best, be misunderstood or just you know, a curiosity in some ways. You might be, in some cases, blackmailed or bribed. There's been a lot of documentation about that. Um, you might, if you live in a country that, uh, where homosexuality is criminalized, you might have the police called. That happens. So what's, what's your likely response? You're going to be driven underground, right? You're, you're going to wait if you're sick. You're going to wait to the last possible moment to go get care, where something that could have been easily preventable now 
may kill you. Who knows? You're not going to get screening. You're not going to do preventive care the way that most people consider part of their basic health care. Um, you, uh, you basically are sort of cutting off that, that part of your self-care. So let's be a little bit more specific here. There's a phenomenon called minority stress that's been documented, well documented in the US. Um, and it's really about what happens when you're facing harassment, oppression, isolation. Uh, and it, it is a real psychological phenomenon, which leads often to depression, suicide, overeating, et cetera. Substance abuse is a huge issue in our communities. We know that the risk of depression, suicide, substance abuse and other mental disorders is at least two times higher in LGBT, LGB populations. I don't include transgender here because it's very poorly researched. We don't have that much information. We do know from studies mostly in the US and Western Europe that LGBT youth are three to seven times more likely to attempt suicide than straight youth. And obviously, <laughs> if you're undergoing torture abuse, violence in any way, you're going to have long-lasting scars. There is, by the way, very, very little data from outside of Western Europe and Australia and the US. So if you all have any interest or, or <laughs> connections to Ministry of Health and, and I mean, I, I really think that there's such a gap in understanding and documentation um, in this whole realm, it would be hugely important to try and do that. So uh, these are th the three areas I just want to touch on briefly. So lesbian, bi, and trans women, um, the issue of violence, and then the issue of HIV. So as I mentioned earlier, the kinds of uh, vulnerabilities that you might see in lesbian and bi women and some trans people would be breast and cervical cancer, two conditions for which there is screening, especially cervical cancer. Um, unintended pregnancy and sexual risk taking. There was a really interesting study that came out of um, New York uh, that uh, school aged, like high school aged uh, boys and girls who identified themselves as bi or questioning or queer in some way, were more than two times likely to either have caused or to have had an unintended pregnancy. And it, again, you can kind of make sense of that. It's not necessarily intuitive, but if you're not sure and you're not, and you're questioning, you may not take advantage of information about how to protect yourself. Uh, and so this, this study has caused in the public health <laughs> field quite a lot of stir because what happens typically in terms of youth so-called youth-friendly services and, and um, is people don't think about uh, queer and questioning kids, teenagers, and what their needs may be. And so they're not getting information. They don't feel welcomed in. They don't feel comfortable. And, and the, you see that in the results of, of health. Um, I already talked about alcohol, tobacco, substance abuse, um, obesity, cardiovascular disease, depression. HIV is another one. Oh, you're a lesbian. You're not, you're not at risk for HIV, which is, might be true, might not be true. Most women I know at some point may have been exposed, may have been, may have been involved in heterosexual relationships, number one. In a lot of countries where it's not safe to be out and open, you may be married in a straight marriage or vice versa. Your husband, maybe he's having sex with men, but he's also having sex with you. So, you know, these things, we don't all fit in neat categories in life. And, and so there's a presumption that we, that we do, number one. And number two, those assumptions lead to real neglect in um, providing information and services that people need. So 
The issue of violence is a painful one. Um, you know, violence is many horrible things, um, but it's also a public health issue if it's endemic. And it's endemic in our communities in a lot of places. Um, in my view, it's, it's, and not just my view, <laughs> it's generally recognized that it's a form of gender-based violence. This is a punishing of people who are seen to be defying gender norms. So um, you can imagine that, uh, you know, first of all, lesbians and transgender women are at higher risk uh, because of the power dynamics that occur in so many societies and gender inequality and, and even within families. Um, there's been documentation through civil society and human rights groups and now the UN that the nature of violence tends to be more vicious compared to other bias motivated crimes. What's really tough is that we don't really know the extent of the violence that takes place because in a lot of countries people don't report it. I have, I have friends in Tanzania for example, the last place they would go would be the police because it'll just be further violated. So this happens in a lot of countries where you don't have recourse and you don't, you, you simply then don't report and therefore you don't get seen and you don't get counted. The organization I've been involved with out, outright, um, we did a study in five countries in Asia, um, Japan, Malaysia, Pakistan, the Philippines and Sri Lanka, very in-depth qualitative study. Um, and what came out of that, it's the first ever study on lesbian, bi and, and trans women in this region. Um, I mean, these are, these are perhaps fairly obvious findings, but it's never been documented that, that lesbian, bi and trans women um, face violence in every sphere of their lives, that it's worse in the countries where homosexuality is criminalized, and it's particularly bad within families, um, which is, of course, disturbing. So family violence was a huge issue in these countries. And then the discrimination in terms of health, education, employment was also part of what they, they um, part of the experience that they had, not, not necessarily related to violence, but just part of their experience. Um, I would really be remiss if I didn't talk about what is feeling almost like an epidemic of violence among trans people in the U.S., trans women in particular, and trans women of color especially. Uh, we have had a real uptick in our country in this regard, and it's tragic, and it, a lot of the same things that I've talked about happens, it happens in the U.S. where trans women especially feel so disempowered that they don't trust the systems that are out there to help them to actually provide the help they need. So I'm going to switch to HIV. Um, when I talk about LGBT and health issues, the first thing that people think about is HIV, but I purposely left it until last because the health issues are far broader than that. But HIV is very important um, and an important discussion to have. So this is a public health term, men who have sex with men, because we know that a lot of men don't identify get as gay or bi, but they're having, sexual, they're, they're having sex with other men. So in the public health world, this is how we refer to a behavior, not an identity. And there have been a number of studies around the world that show that so-called MSM are four to 19 times more likely to be living with HIV but less than one in 10 MSM worldwide has access to HIV services. So this is a little bit dated, but the last study confirmed this in, in 2014. Um, we have almost no information, again, on transgender populations, more coming out. Um, and I mean, I just want to point out this chart. So the, the blue here is MSM populations and, and pre HIV prevalence. The red is the so-called general population. So we have Guatemala, Jamaica, Cote d'Ivoire, Zambia, Malawi, Vietnam, China, and Ukraine. And you see this pattern 
not just in these countries. You see this pattern everywhere. You see it in my own country, and it reflects perhaps behavior that's riskier, but it also reflects an issue of access to services and, and issues of stigma and discrimination in, in getting services. There's a really amazing group called the Global Forum on MSM and HIV, and they held a consultation um, with so-called MSM from many countries around the world in, in 2010. And these, you know, this again, th these, these themes are, are what they pulled out as being the most important. So in, in terms of access to services, homophobia, transphobia, discrimination, HIV specific stigma, criminalization, uh, insensitivity, lack of provider awareness, and then just general safety. And one of the participants um, that was at this meeting said that equal health for all is not possible when places close to home judge, stigmatize, and fundamentally contradict the universal dignity of all. And that's pretty much sums it up, if you ask me. I have um, a bit of information on Ukraine. Um, this is from the pro uh, USAID-funded project called Respond from a few years ago. And while this isn't necessarily self-identified LGBT people or MSM, it's, it's people with HIV. 20% uh, of, of people living with HIV report being refused health care, and 37% experienced violation of confidentiality. We actually, this is actually an improvement from data that that I've seen from earlier years that I think it was the All Ukrainian Network for People Living with HIV did, where they actually showed higher rates of uh, breaches in confidentiality, refusal of services. So this may actually represent some progress. In the US, I think it's important to point out, this is from 2010, a study that a group called Lambda Legal did where um, you see that this first table is on, on I quote, the question what, or the statement was, I was refused needed health care. So lesbian, gay, bisexual people, 7.7%. Transgender, 26.7%. People living with HIV, 19. The second table was healthcare professionals refused to, refused to touch me or used excessive precautions. So again, you see this, this pattern. In this case, living with HIV was, was higher. So this is, this is pervasive. This isn't just Ukraine. It isn't just countries in Africa. This is human nature, unfortunately. On the issue of transgender issues specifically, what's happened, and I think and I hope it's slowly shifting, but you know, so much money poured in uh, for HIV, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, but all over the world there's been really a lot of funding. It never feels like enough, and it probably isn't enough in many ways. But what's happened is that the strategies that were devised often completely neglected the specific needs of transgender people, so that transgender people were lumped together with MSM. Their issues are completely different, especially transgender women. So um, there, there, it's, it's absolutely a gap in programming and an area that needs a great deal more attention. I'll just point out here, in the US, I think um, people, transgender people, maybe it's not just the US actually, are 49 times more likely to have HIV than so-called general population. So that's, that's what we're talking about. Just an example of what happens when, when very discriminatory legislation um, is put in place. This is Nigeria after the Same Sex Prohibition Act that I mentioned earlier. This is a, an organization uh, called the Population Council that was serving HIV patients. Uh, went from reaching 1,700 men in three months uh, to half to zero. Um, so over that period of three months, they lost all their clients. They, they were too afraid to come. So that's what happens when you have this kind of punitive le legislation put in place. There's an interesting um, thing going on now, um, more recently, just in the last couple, couple of years, where um, the issue, the whole issue of 
human rights for LGBT people is, is being approached not so much from a human rights frame, but from a development and economic development frame. Um, and it may be more successful, we'll, we'll see. Uh, the World Bank actually sponsored this research, which was done by uh, a woman I know named Lee, Lee Badgett. Uh, and what she did was try and model out what the cost of exclusion looks like. So if part of, if you are, if you are excluding the act, the, the full participation of your citizenry, some part of that citizenry isn't at, able to provide or, or give their full selves to the country, to their work, to employment, et cetera. What is, what is it going to look like? And what is it going to look like in terms of costs related to health, to social services, if you have people who are cast out basically living on streets. I mean, she tried to look at lots of different dimensions and she used India as the example. And she came out with sort of this, this range and it's a range because it's modeling. And so she had different scenarios. But um, on the high side, when looking at um, issues just related to HIV disparity, so in other words, people who aren't getting the care that they need, mental health in the form of depression, suicide, she came up with somewhere, you know, 712 million to 23 billion. It's a huge range, but, but the numbers themselves aren't so much the point as it is that discrimination costs countries in some way. And so can this argument be made? I personally have a little bit of an aversion to using an economic argument for what should be a human rights argument, but I'm also in favor for, uh, in favor of looking at the, at the issue in, in whatever way that's going to help convince people. So I think we need to bring all these perspectives together. So I'm just going to wind up here pretty soon. The report that I mentioned earlier that came out of the 2014 resolution came out with some recommendations. These are the recommendations. So these are from 2015, about a year ago. So repealing laws, obviously. Um, enacting effective anti-discrimination laws. So there are two issues related to legislation. Better investigation of homophobic and transphobic hate crimes, torture and related abuses, and then imposing strict, strict penalties for perpetrators and making it illegal to incite hatred. So these are, these are uh, recommendations that the United uh, Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights um, published. Oh, sorry, three more, ban the forced and involuntary treatment of, and medical procedures of LGBT people. I didn't really touch on this, but this is a huge issue for especially transgender and intersex people um, where their so-called conditions are considered medical problems and medical solutions are therefore needed and the person in question may not have a lot of um, power or they, they, their, their consent is not all often respected. And that's, that's the issue. So um, and it's a huge and very important topic, but probably beyond what we can, we can do right now. Um, ensure that no one fleeing persecution is returned and put back in danger. This, is, this touches on the, all the asylum issues going on. And for me, working as an activist in the global space, this one is so important. Consult LGBTI people and civil society when making laws and policies or being supportive. So they need to be at the table. So if, if the government of Ukraine is considering legislation, they need to have the key activists and advocates at the table providing their input. And, um, and I hope I believe this is going to be happening more and more, and I certainly hope so. So let me tell you quickly, I'm almost done, why I'm optimistic. <laughs> because in my work as a health, um, public health person, I've had the tremendous opportunity to, to, to work in a lot of different countries and meet a lot of activists in my so-called off hours and sometimes not my off hours. So um, I've met a number of groups in Sub-Saharan Africa and what I can tell you 
and not just Africa, but around the world, what I can tell you is that there is such vibrancy in the world right now, in every corner of the world right now, where people are standing up and fighting for their rights. And I find this moving beyond belief. So these are just logos of some groups in Africa that I've, I've met. This is a group, Lega Bibo, they are from Botswana. They fought for years simply to register their organization. And they finally got registered a, about a month ago. It was historic because with criminalization, they, you know, how can you register as an NGO if you're, not, if, if you're a criminal, so-called? So this was an enormous turning point for them. This is Vietnam, a place I've also spent a lot of time in. And their movement is moving so fast. Um, different issues than here and in the US. But they did this flash mob in, in 2013. They had their first pride parade in 2013. They're moving very quickly. Doesn't mean they're not also facing backlash. But it's incredibly exciting to see. China is another place where I've worked, a place where you wouldn't necessarily think there'd be a whole lot of um, positive news on this front. It's incredible. It's incredible what's happening. Some of the most strong, courageous activists I've met who just keep pushing, pushing, pushing against the line of what the government will allow, including staging same-sex marriage in Tiananmen Square. And then, of course, <laughs> I'm so excited <laughs> to be in Kiev for Kiev Pride. And as I said, I mean, I've been coming to Ukraine since 1997. And I don't live day to day here under, um, you know, sort of the, the, the daily, uh, I don't know, circumstances of LGBT people. But I can see very clearly how things are developing. And I'm just... Um, so grateful to be here and so happy that, uh, that things are moving along. Many of you may know this quote from Martin Luther King, one of my all-time favorites. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And that's the thing that I just hold on to every day. We're going to prevail. We're going to get there. It's going to take a while. There are going to be backlashes. We're human people. We deserve equality. We, don't, we, we deserve to be treated just like everybody else. Not specially, but just like everybody else. So, diakuyu, pasiba, thank you. Okay. Questions, comments, controversy. <laughs> yes. No, no. Right, right. It's a really, really important question. And I, I'm reluctant to answer it specifically for Ukraine because I think um, you have some really amazing activists actually here in the room who can probably shed light on the best approach in Ukraine to, to the, this issue of religion. I can say that in other, in other countries I've observed and in, in our own country, it really took Sorry, I'm moving the microphone. It really took a huge amount of time and effort to find allies within religious communities, 
whether in sort of the so-called hierarchy or congregations, and it and you know slowly but surely bringing a different perspective to religious groups. That's not to say that it's possible across the board. I can for sure tell you that there are some, the conservative religious factions in the US at this point, we almost have to disregard because it's not possible to, to really move them. But there are many more people who are in the middle and there are many more people who are with us. And so I think that's, that's the thing is to, um, to really look at how you can con connect on a human level. You're not going to be able to argue scripture with, you know, as a not, you know, that, that, that will never really work. So the other way is to get interfaith and, and religious leaders of different perspectives together and have that kind of a discussion. I don't know if that helps. I don't know if any, anybody here uh, or and others who want to address that point. Um, yes? Actually, uh, my name is Andriy. I'm from Brown University, but I used to work with Peace Corps here for Oh, like, great. Years. I was in the Peace Corps. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I just uh, wanted to bring up uh, this uh, new lens. Uh, you mentioned the minority stress. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And specifically speaking about religion, mm -hmm. uh, specifically speaking about like some other uh, the, the military people in the role for those men and women who are now uh, at war in the east of Ukraine. Uh, there are lesbian and gay and bisexual people among them. And how do they feel uh, mm -hmm. um, with, uh, given that the society in Ukraine here is uh, drawing clear lines between your either a patriot fighting in a tour mm. or your gay and lesbian. So mm. this theory mm. uh, mm. of intersectionality, I think, is very important. And uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around uh, about, uh, around how to actually uh, give it out. Uh, yeah. Incredibly important. And I mean, I didn't use the word, but I, earlier in my talk, when I, I talked about joining forces essentially with other movements, whether it's uh, in, in our context, um, anti-racist, uh, Black Lives Matter, for example, in the US, um, or immigration rights or other movements, we need to be working in coalition. And that's how we reach a broader and broader people. We, we need straight allies, too. We need straight allies, and we need religious straight allies. And, you know, so I mean, there's so, you, you, can, you have to approach it from many, many dimensions. You're absolutely right. Thank you for your comment. Other? Yes? Yes, my name is Pablo Marcelo, and I'm the representative of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh -huh. As you know, we have been emphasizing uh, the protection mm -hmm. of LGBTI refugees and asylum seekers mm -hmm. uh, in the recent past. Um, yes. I arrived here in Ukraine in January, mm -hmm. and uh, our program here is helping to sets of uh, population categories. The first one is internally displaced because yes. of the conflict. Mm -hmm. And the second is uh, refugees mm -hmm. who come from other countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that I found when I came is that we, we had no contact whatsoever with the associations that are helping LGBTI mm. uh, Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's enough evidence that shows that uh, those who are internally displaced and who happen to belong to this community suffer double discrimination. Exactly, exactly. On the one hand, there's a little bit of uh, discrimination here, not a whole lot, against people who come from the East, mm -hmm. you know, internally displaced mm -hmm. uh, persons, for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and second, they're also discriminated because, you know, they uh, have a different sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. So I've been mm -hmm. encouraging my colleagues to reach out. First, they used to tell me, no, but you know, these associations, they don't want to be, you know, associated with other organizations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I said, how do you know? Have you been in touch with them? Do you know whether they Thank you. need yes. some support? So yeah, now, yeah. Um, I'm happy to report that uh, those initial steps have been taken, and uh, we're trying to see, you know, how we can uh, 
um, support each other. With respect to refugees, I also found that we have something called the Diversity Initiative, mm. which is together with the International Organization for Migrations, but they uh, decided that they would not reach out to other population categories, that they would only keep track and try to um, do something about hate crimes against foreigners, refugees, asylum seekers, right? And I kept asking, why are you not you know, building alliances with other groups that are also trying to promote diversity mm -hmm. and also follow up on hate crimes. Right. You know? Well, you know, we didn't want to... Uh, Offend or, yes. Well, no, to spread ourselves too thin, uh, etc. Uh -huh. But now I think finally I've been able to convince them that we need to do that because I fully agree with you. I think, you know, we need to build alliances. Mm -hmm. uh, discrimination is discrimination. Exactly. Whether you are yeah. discriminating someone because that person has a different skin color or that person has a different nationality, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. it's the same. It's the you same. Are discriminating people because they're different. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully, we're not there yet, mm -hmm. but hopefully we will uh, be able to make a small contribution because, you know, this is not our necessarily our main mandate. Right, sure. As an agency, I think we need, to, we need to make sure that we contribute to the effort yeah. of yeah. yeah, thank you so much for raising that issue and also for your work here, because it's incredibly important. The Outright Action International, we do work actually with um, refugee populations that are currently in Turkey coming, fleeing ISIS territories. We're actually also doing work in Iraq um, providing safe uh, havens and shelters, uh, particularly and especially for LGBT people, because as you point out, in, in those kinds of dire situations, internal displacement, uh, refugee status, um, what you find is certain populations are more vulnerable than others. And, and in, in terms of LGBT people, they for sure get left out, get their their issues uh, either ignored or even, I mean, unfortunately, I'm, I'm so glad to hear of, of this work because within a number of UN agencies, which are made up of people, <laughs> you know, we, I've, I have a friend who's an Iraqi asylum seeker in Seattle who his first experience with UNHCR in uh, Beirut, I think it was, basically said, he was saying, if I go back to Iraq, I'm going to be killed. And the direct response back was, we don't care about gay people. End of story. Maybe I can just comment with you. I didn't understand if you got in touch with this organization. Uh, my name is Anna. I'm, I work for Heinrich Bill Foundation here in Ukraine, and I'm also one of the key pride organizers. And uh, since I've worked with LGBT uh, organizations for a while, there is only one in Ukraine inside that or they have a shelter for uh, internally displaced LGBT people. Um, but I think they, they keep struggling with the funding. Mm -hmm. And this, because they have to provide this direct assistance, giving people money or mm. the mm. support, it's something that the most donors are reluctant to support. Um, so you, you, you are probably in touch with them. I think so, but I will find out. But uh, inside, is, uh, inside, I think it's one of the organizations we have reached out to. I think it is, to, to the best of my knowledge, there's the only one working in Ukraine with this issue. Um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I know that uh, the organization uh, No Borders, and you probably work with, with them, the, the project, the No Borders project, they work mm -hmm. with uh, refugees, uh, most of from Central Asia, from Uzbekistan, and they also. Uh, no borders, it's here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far as I know, they work uh, with uh, issues as well. Great. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Thoughts? Yes. Yeah, as you said, that and more people agree that it's so essential actually to cooperate with other movements and mm -hmm. with other minorities. Uh, could you speak a bit about your experience in other countries? Uh, how do you see development of cooperation between uh, majority of society and sexual minorities? Uh, and how do you see the ways and possibilities like to reach not only from uh, uh, not only 
to understand from majority side the needs of sexual minorities, but mm -hmm. also how uh, how the sexual minorities can take more and more initiative, involve more uh, mm -hmm. people that, like you said, it become norm, not yeah. treatment, additional special treatment, but as as a norm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, it's, a, it's an interesting question because it depends on how you define sort of majority, minority, and if you're talking about majority as straight people, yeah. then, then okay, but even within, I mean, I'm used to a, a cultural context that's very um, diverse, and so people's identities intersect and cross, so that's because, that's why I'm saying it's a little bit of a, a more complicated question in my own context, but um, as I mentioned earlier, I really do think that um, building allies, straight allies, friends, individuals, people who will, who will be at your side, um, I think there are several avenues that, where this plays out. So, you know, we've talked a lot about legislation, so, you know, that's, that's one avenue is, you, is, is um, where it's necessary putting in place protective legislation and that means that you have to you have to convince a broad base of people who are in power to to write and pass legislation to be on your side there's the issue of the media the media i don't think can be underestimated um, because I, in the u.s for example and i'm not saying it would necessarily work or be the same here but you know, it was popular culture that had a huge influence on the, quote, majority opinion, where, where LGBT characters were woven into storylines of incredibly popular TV shows, for example, um, where you had, um, even in advertisements or, you, you, you know, radio shows, whatever it might be that kind of humanizes us. <laughs> Um, which seems ridiculous, but anyway, it, it is necessary. <laughs> um, and um, so I think, I think media and popular culture is a really important avenue. Um, and then I think, um, obviously, through NGO work and civil society work and, and through individual relationships. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, question specifically, but I can tell you that those are some of the strategies that we used in the U.S. in together, not one or the other, but kind of as a, as a, a package of, of, of reaching people. I think we also found in the U.S. that um, going too heavy on, on law and human rights and sort of that approach didn't speak to people's hearts and minds. You've probably heard this term, hearts and minds. It didn't really speak to that. And, and that's ultimately where you get individuals to, to change their thinking. And usually that comes through experience and exposure. So I guess to, to your other question about what does the LGBT community need to do, um, I would never tell anybody you need to be out or you need, you know, it's absolutely an individual decision based on their own personal circumstances and context and all of that. But as I can tell you that in, in the US, as more people felt they were able to be out or decided to take the risk to be out, we saw more and more change happen. So, yeah. Um, my name is Jennifer. I'm also from Brown by way of the University Great. of Washington. Oh, um, and, ah, uh, even better. The <laughs> question I had was, in the United States, uh, one of the most well-known organizations that promoted uh, LGBTQ rights is the Human Rights, rights Campaign. Right. And this organization has, um, even though it's done really important, necessary things, has received some criticism, um, which in the interest of full disclosure, I, I agree with um, that. So do I, I think, but go <laughs> ahead. That it um, sacrificed some attention and effort for trans rights yes. in an effort to promote gay yes. rights. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it was a very soft tactic of, of just ignoring, or maybe it wasn't brought to the front of the room as much as it should have been, and other times it was more of a hard discrimination and that some leaders were like, well, one step at a time, you wait your turn, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so so we're, we're dealing with that in the United States. We're trying to overcome from it, uh, you know, fix it, all of this. I have been thinking about this a long time, and I don't have a good answer, mm -hmm. and so I don't expect you to have a perfect answer, but I would love your <laughs> oh, good. perspective okay. on what, can, what lessons can be taken from these, I think, honest mistakes that were made in previous efforts, mm -hmm. especially for 
campaigns like here in Kyiv or in Ukraine in general, where you know what what can we learn to help make sure that human rights efforts mm -hmm. include all humans, that right. there are not some equal rights right. more equal than right. others. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I mean, uh, the, the very short answer of this is, uh, in my opinion, and, and because of seeing approaches that have taken the kind of course that you describe, um, nobody should be left behind, full stop. Nobody should be left behind. This cannot be, we'll give, we'll work for these rights here, and then we'll get to yours in a minute, or in a year, or in 10 years, because it ends up creating divisions within your own movement, number one, and you're less effective. Um, and you do leave people behind with that kind of a, an approach. You are not, it's very hard to go back and, you know, it's, it, it doesn't work well. It's not a coherent strategy. It needs to be, um, it needs to be in the same way that I would argue, um, that in, in countries where human rights abuses occur kind of across the board for a variety of people and populations, it doesn't necessarily make sense to pull out LGBT people only or other populations only. You need to look across the board and say, this is unacceptable. These people deserve full respect, protection, dignity, and rights, and not pull out different subpopulations because it's that's that's not how society should be it is for everyone period full stop so i know exactly what you're talking about with hrc and and um had major issues with with that approach and they continue to do that they are in general a more conservative i would say organization but um so i don't know if that that answers or helps with perspective other thoughts or questions? Yes. Um, this is going to be a little of reverse Q&A. You asked uh, every one of us, what do we think about the laws that come back yeah. uh, that prohibits human rights? And um, I'm by no means a politician or have the authority to speak for everyone. But uh, as for me, I believe uh, that as long as uh, this whole topic of uh, LGBT people is um, divided from the politics arena, from the war that's happening right now, mm -hmm. as long as uh, people are able uh, to understand that uh, this is not some other uh, group that needs mm -hmm. special treatment, mm -hmm. like you said, mm -hmm. uh, that this is our people, this is mm -hmm. our nation, and right. we are every we are one, right. basically. Right. Uh, as long as uh, this understanding persists in people's minds, I think this uh, laws like this won't be able to pass. I honestly hope this. I hope. I hope so too. Thank you. I appreciate that. Other questions or related? Yes. Just one more piece of information. I was thankful again that you brought up uh, the India example mm -hmm. and the World Bank study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, um, just uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago, I was uh, I did some recalculations with a calculator. Oh. Very simple. <laughs> and uh, brought it to Ukraine reality. Uh huh. Uh, so uh, the study actually cites that the losses, economic losses from discrimination, from homophobia and transphobia, it's more like between 0 0.1 percent and 1.7 percent mm -hmm. of gross domestic product for the country in India. No one did this in Ukraine. Probably it will be a little different. Mm -hmm. But just the simple calculations, I took 2013 GDP and I multiplied it. <laughs> so we have between $177 million to uh, $3 billion losses, economic losses, in this country that is at war, that does need this money, only because of homophobia and transphobia. Wow. That's, you need to... You need to pursue that and <laughs> sharpen, you know, however you want to approach it. But that, that, is, um, that is really interesting bit of information. Thank you. Do you have plans to share that or do further work on that? Well, so far, I just posted it on my Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this uh, in the weeks, the conference a couple of weeks from now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Do you know Lee Badgett? Are you in... Are you in 
I'm happy to put you in touch with her if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's quite amazing. Great, great. Yes, please. I have just one last comment. Just, I would like yeah. to come back to, uh, to the topic of media and uh, mm -hmm. uh, how LGBT community can interact and try to, to uh, involve more of the rest of the community. Right. And, and I have one suggestion and one question. Okay. Probably not for you, but for Please, the yes. people. Yes, yes, much more appropriate. From, yes, I'm yes. I'm from Ukraine and I don't know like, the situation, but uh, I would like to talk about like uh, a powerful media, which is the internet, and in particular YouTube. Why? Because uh, I know that there are several, several American YouTubers that are gay and uh, they openly discuss about this. and. Uh, I mean, I follow a lot of them, yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, and I, I really uh, I think that it could be very interesting to, to try the same like in, in Ukraine, but I don't know. Like, they are just people talking about their lives. They're not just doing such strange things. They just uh, talk about their lives and the situation they face, or and they have a very huge impact on Hmm. Young, young Americans and mm -hmm. also young Italians, for example. <laughs> and, uh, and so, I'm, my question for you is: Do you think that in Ukraine this could be effective? I mean, how much this platform is used in Ukraine? Do you think this can can be a possibility to to create this connection? Uh, I think it's not very good, or um, I'm sorry, lack of gathering. Uh, it's hard to explain. To use such connection between LGBT people uh, by YouTube or other media, I don't know. Um, Good luck. Do you have it? Side. Do you have yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Because. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, because here, Thank you so much. a lot of young people are afraid of being um, beaten. I don't know. To um, walk around the street and uh, face a fully young who saw him on YouTube and, uh, I don't know, every, um, every time when um, here in Ukraine, in Russia, and in other post-Soviet people, post-Soviet uh, countries, when, um, uh, I'm sorry, it's not my popularity. Well, I think we're just afraid of doing it because we're afraid of being, I don't know, afraid of aggression. But then the problem wouldn't be like the power of the media, but just fear. But that would go with everything. I don't know, maybe uh, we just need to start, yes, media, but not by uh, mm, personal, mm, I don't know. Okay, no, I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, please, uh, is this on the same? I yeah. believe uh, actually it's quite the opposite because uh, internet provides you with anonymity, with uh, a very powerful tool that allows you to speak without being uh, subjected to some sort of, uh, I don't know, maybe prohibition or being judged based on your sexuality or nationality or whatever. Um, so in Ukraine, uh, we are in the IT sphere uh, somewhere uh, some would call the second India because we have a very developed IT infrastructure and we are uh, a nation that has a very uh, good media coverage. So uh, like internet media, videos, uh, social networks, this sort of thing. Young people actually inter are interested in this and uh, they use this type of channels. So it uh, would be very influential to develop this sort of communication because uh, the maybe uh, older population or uh, more, uh, I don't know how to call it, um, people that are very reluctant to change their minds uh, due to their age or religion or something, they are not using this sort of channel. So basically, if you need to speak to the youth, you need to use a uh, modern channel. And so I believe it, is very effective. it will be very effective hmm. to use that sort of thing.
the, oh, is it the same topic or? Yes. Okay, and then, and then you, yeah. Good, Sorry. great question. No, right. <laughs> I'm from Latin America, where mm. significant progress has been made yeah. I think, in recent years. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, we were quite uh, in a bad situation. The situation is not perfect now, but there's been significant improvement. Same-sex marriage has been approved in many countries. Mm -hmm. There are laws that have been passed. There are commissions that also try to prevent discrimination, etc. But one of the medium that uh, was used uh, in many countries is soap operas. I don't know if you yeah. know soap operas, telenovela. Telenovela. Very popular in Latin America. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that was used to, as you did in the US, mm -hmm. introduce uh, LGBTI characters in the telenovelas, portraying them uh, in a very positive light. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you still have the stereotypes that mm -hmm. have been some. Uh, so pop operas, but in general, they try to to do that. We also mm -hmm. uh, use uh, so pop operas to try to combat uh, racism. Uh, they have used so pop operas to also work on uh, family planning. So you know, you each culture, each country, each region needs to identify, you know, mm -hmm. the different means that you need to use. Because as you were saying, elderly people they don't use the internet, right? So you may change the attitudes of young people, but you will not change the attitudes of older people. Mm -hmm. But at least in Latin America, you know, adults and, 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 and elderly, mm -hmm. they watch soap operas. Yeah. So yeah. that what has yeah. changed, you know, some of the minds, right. not all of them. We still have problems. There's still a lot of violence, as you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. uh, particularly against trans transgender. Mm -hmm. uh, so we still have a long way to go, mm -hmm. but I think we have also made quite a lot of improvements. Yeah. You know, I know you wanted to make a comment, but just you just triggered a. So uh, in Washington State, before the federal uh, marriage equality law went into effect, um, you know, it was a state by state thing. And Washington State initially had legislation that was passed, and then it was challenged by a referendum. Um, and so if the popular vote was in favor of this referendum, then it would be removed as law. So we became very active in this. And one of the things that we did as a family um, to get out the vote um, to, to support marriage equality, and Nicholas will probably remember this, um, we, <laughs> we went to um, elderly residences, like old age homes, we used to call them, but you know, senior citizen residences. And, and with a number of other people, we, would, we, we simply talked about our family, why this is important, what are the issues, et cetera, et cetera. And you know what was really interesting? And these were elderly people of a variety of different backgrounds. I had probably six or eight people come up to me and say, I am so glad you're here. We never got to talk about this. My grandson, nephew, brought, you know, <laughs> No, you know, it was a secret in our family, or it was, you know, and, and it was t what I took from, from what I was hearing from at least some of these people coming up to me was that actually it was a relief that it was being talked about openly, that it had been this kind of pressured secret it, that they also felt compelled to keep. So you never know is sort of <laughs> my point, but it, I, I digressed a little, but it, you know, I think just because someone's elderly doesn't mean they're not going to change their minds, number one. And I'm approaching those years, so <laughs> I hope to keep an open mind. Anyway, you, you also had another comment. Yeah. Yes, about education for young people. Mm -hmm. Often, talking to educators, working with formal education, they talk about how they don't want to change the Not not much better, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You know, any examples or something that you came across in your work which you think is a good practice? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, um, there are there are definitely examples out there um, f for Americans in the room and maybe not um, Planned Parenthood uh, in the U.S. In, in, in its in its chapters, but also led nationally, has some really really excellent um, curricula and programming aimed at youth on on sexuality and gender nonconformity. That of course they can't be in the schools necessarily, or if it's a public school, but. Um, but I think you can find some tremendous resources. And, and so the idea of um, having youth centers and drop-in centers where you might be able to have a bit more flexibility in what you can share, and again, I'm not sure what all the possibilities would be here in Ukraine, but in, the, in sort of the, the civil society pub, private space, i.e. not government funded or not, um, government uh, endorsed. There are many. There are many ways to to reach kids, and it's it, it is incredibly important. I mean, you you see um, how kids can really suffer, and um, so it's it's really vital that that kind of programming get out there. But I, I Planned Parenthood comes to mind first of all. You go on their website, and you know you'll find I think quite a quite a bit. And sometimes it's it's um, not so central. It's by state and kind of, but even the Washington State one is really quite good. So I don't know if that helps, but it's a challenge. I mean, I, I, they're, they're in the U.S. We're so um, phobic about sexuality, education, and you know the, the whole issue of abortion and all of this stuff that it all gets wrapped up together. And and unless you're in a non-government funded school, it's really difficult to have a comprehensive, I mean, what, what is provided is very watered down, I would say. Please. Um, did you ask about the differences between uh, homophobia and USA and in Ukraine? Because in Ukraine, we yeah. see that usually men are stigmatized for having same-sex uh, relations, and the women are considered not like that seriously. Mm -hmm. like, you know, some college experiments like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, so we see that uh, men are usually stigmatized, and uh, mm -hmm. even in the uh, Soviet Union, men were criminalized. Uh, and women not. Yeah, yeah, women were not. So is it the same in USA? Do they have more stigma for men? That's really hard to say at this time. I think at a, at a period in our, our history, that's probably true, and I think it's true in a lot of countries. I think with, with um, like 70s and 80s, the rise of the women's movement, women's rights movement, um, whereas being a lesbian woman or a bisexual woman may have been minimized or disregarded or thought not to really be real or these kinds of things, that before that period of sort of 70s, 80s, that might have been the case. But, but then it became more threatening to the sort of patriarchal structures of society. And so um, I would say now, uh, the, the group that's most stigmatized are transgender people, much more than gay or lesbian or bisexual people, by far. And, and so they are the ones who are really suffering the most mis misunderstanding, violence, abuse, harassment, now subject of these stupid bathroom laws in our country, things like this. So that's, that, to me, that's what the picture is now. It's really more about transgender people. It's not that that uh, stereotypes and stigma and you know all of that doesn't <laughs> exist for 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 the, the rainbow of of the family but um, but that's how I see it now evolving Does that help yeah yes if I could go back to the previous comment sure. um, on education of course um, so so first of all thank you for gathering us here and I'm glad that so many Ukrainians are here and <laughs> me too <laughs> But so I know of a project in India, and it's mm -hmm. not necessarily, necessarily about uh, sexuality, but it's, mm -hmm. um, um, it's, um, it's called uh, Menstropedia, I think, mm. where um, I just heard a TED talk where this woman was talking about how not many women, young women in India don't know uh, or know about menstruation and their body in general and how when they're teaching it in biology classes, they're often uh, skipping the whole chapter, basically. Um, and so they created this book that had four characters, um, and the characters had these names. Yeah. It was in like cartoons, and it had and it had like different illustrations and stuff like that. 
So right. I think this would be a good idea to implement um, in Ukraine because this book became so comfortable for people to use and read and like boys and girls and That's uh, fantastic. teachers. That's yeah. fantastic. Um, and the book is now being translated into like 12 different languages. Um, so I don't know if we have it in Ukraine. I was actually going to check that. But um, something like that could be if someone has access um, to, because we can't really change the law and gather all of the teachers in Ukraine now, but maybe creating a book like that. Um, right. With other channels, yeah, using other channels. To yeah. talk about, um, yeah. about difficult topics or about obvious things um, that are not being talked about. Right, right, great. That's fantastic. I have to look that up. Yes? I would just observe that, that that tactic of using comics has actually been used by an NGO in Mikolaev, and I don't remember their name, but it's a Liga. I'm sorry? Liga. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's a little little one. that one? Oh. Or is it, they're it's a, they, they do harm reduction work uh -huh. with women, so um, people who are involved in drug use or sex work, and so it's a, it's a different, very different topic, really. But um, but they've used this uh, strategy mm -hmm. to start a lot of conversations and mm -hmm. also share a lot of mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. There'll be a comic about a woman who, you know, her boyfriend is violent, and they'll just kind of like go through this sort of soft story to explain like, well, here's options, or mm -hmm. maybe you know you will be okay staying with a friend, you know, things like that. So right. it's, it's that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so it could certainly be repeated. Yeah. That's great. That's great. You you had another comment? Did you? No. No. Sorry. Oh. Um, yes. So it's, uh, it's just a comment as well about education because uh, we've been discussing about these last days. Uh, I'm also not from Ukraine. I'm from Portugal. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I really notice in my country is that uh, gender stereotypes are mm. also really related mm. with uh, discrimination. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think it's really important in uh, in education, especially with younger uh, kids, right. uh, to talk about um, gender stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And I was watching in the internet, there was this teacher, and she did something really, really simple. I don't remember the country, but she started talking about these, uh, for example, jobs that we related more with men. Mm. Uh, and she was, I uh, saw that. <laughs> yes, England. It was the UK, I it think. Was UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I found it really interesting because then she really invited, for example, she asked about firefighter, astronaut, uh, pilot. Yes, yeah, yes. yes. That professions that in a, in a, in stereotypically associated with men. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And then she actually invited people who worked in that area. But they were women, and mm. it was really interesting to see the reaction. And these were little kids; they're like five, six years old, and they were all excited about meeting the fireman. And the, you know, and then suddenly the woman takes off her hat. You know, and like, ah! so <laughs> wait a minute. But it was just a beautiful way to yeah. kind of challenge that stereotype that had already been ingrained in such little kids, which is also amazing. And I think that sometimes in uh, societies that are not. Uh, culturally used to debate openly LGBTQI issues, starting a little bit with, uh, for example, gender stereotypes, it can really help a little bit mm -hmm. to open, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Like no, it's a, great, it's a great point. Yeah, I mean, and kids, <laughs> you know, my kids when they were in, um, even in preschool, and I'm not going to embarrass you, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but their friends would actually be jealous. Like they, their view was, why does Nicholas get to have two moms and I only have one? <laughs> I mean, literally, this would be sort of the... And so you just appreciate so much the kind of purity of mind of, of young kids and why it's so important to intervene at that age. Oh. Other thoughts or questions? I really, really appreciate you all coming. Thank you. I know it's the middle of a work day. It's not <laughs> so easy to get here and <laughs> everything, but it's really been delightful to talk to with all of you. So I'll be here for a little while if you want to chat. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Did you